Delighted that we're joined today by two members of the Midlands Hub who champion the importance of creating opportunities for undergraduate nurses to engage in clinical research. Dr Sarah Brand is an assistant divisional nurse at Nottingham University Hospitals and Dr Julie Menzies is a nurse researcher at Birmingham Women's and Children's Foundation Trust. She's also an honorary lecturer at the University of Birmingham. Sarah and Julie will be joined today by, by Navita Vijayakumaran and Annabelle Little to discuss the impact of the 70 at 70 programme on undergraduate teaching. Thank you, Cathy, for the introduction and welcome everybody to um, our second webinar. Um, we're really delighted to be talking to you today um, about some of our experiences in um, engaging undergraduate students in clinical research. Um, and Julie and I um, are here to talk about a couple of examples that we've implemented in our trusts um, of ways that we've been able to engage students. And we've also brought a couple of students with, uh, with us who are going to be presenting also to present what their, um, their perspective is from the student perspective on some of the initiatives that we've um, implemented. Um, next slide, please, Lucy. So as uh, Cathy um, described, um, Cathy, myself and um, Julie are members of the senior 70 at 70 Senior Nurse and Midwife Research Leader Programme. Now that's a programme that's funded by the National Institute for Health Research and it's primarily to increase capacity and capability within the nursing workforce for research. Um, what we do have to say is we are talking about um, engaging undergraduates with um, research in our, in our trusts, but what Julie and I will both say is that some of this work was underway prior to us getting um, becoming involved in the 70 at 70 research program but actually it aligns really well with the work of the research program and that's why we're so keen to um, put on a webinar so that we could um, sh showcase what we do in our trust but also generate some discussion amongst other like-minded interested individuals about how we can build on this work and really engage our undergraduate nurses as much as possible with the research agenda. Next slide, please, Lucy. So I'm just going to hand over to Julie, who's going to carry on with the um, presentation. Yeah, thanks very much, Sarah. So I think really what we're sort of talking about here is actually that there's an agenda and there's an expectation of our frontline registered nurses that there's going, there's recognition that they're well placed to identify gaps in clinical practice and um, to develop ideas and strategies to improve the quality of care given to patients. Um, the standards of proficiency um, written by the NMC are explicit about the knowledge and skills we can expect of our future nurses and they outline the role of the nurse for the 21st century. And there's this recognition that our registered nurses need to provide, lead and coordinate care that's compassionate and person centred. They need to be accountable for their own actions and work autonomously and provide leadership as well and to patients with a variety of complex needs. And this confidence and ability to think, think critically and apply knowledge and skills and provide evidence expert direct nursing care is obviously at the centre of everything that we need to do for our students. <clears throat> then in the NMC part one standards framework, there's an expectation about the education institutions designing and delivering programmes to actually ensure that students are proficient in delivering safe and effective care. And what the students from all fields of nursing, they've got to have the right learning supervision and assessment in order to be able to practice as this registered nurse. Within the part three standards, we've then got this recognition that the HEIs and practice placement partners have got to work together to ensure that the students meet the proficiencies relevant to their anticipated field of practice. So really what this means is we've got to kind of generate the right placements for them to be able to achieve this. Um, next slide, please, Lucy. So really what we're saying is our registered nurse of the future needs to have all these core areas and actually we've got to reach create the placements that address all of this. So today we're focusing on two elements of research. The opportunity to see research nurses in action and also this opportunity to learn firsthand about research conduct. Um, next slide please Lucy. So in terms of research careers and clinical academic um, pathways, what we're talking about now is that we've got to give them um, visibility. Research nursing's got to be visible, right from undergraduate stages, because um, how can you want to be something if you've, neither, if you've never seen it or you've got no experience of it? So I'm gonna pass back over to Sarah at this point and the next slide so she can talk about her pathway um, and looking at research placements for nursing students. 
Thank you, Julie. So um, the placements that we have put together in at Nottingham University Hospitals are primarily looking at um, clinical research delivery placements. Next slide. And it's really important. This has been become really important because the um, Council of Deans only recently in June, actually this year, um, published this report um, called Becoming Research Confident. Um, and what they've really outlined in this um, document is that research placements are, are important to all students um, because students need to recognise why they're doing things and not just how to do them. And research placements can aid with that. Um, and they've they um, found that placements give a tangible link between research research and service improvement. So giving students of all professions um, the opportunity to see how research, service improvement and practice development can link together. Um, it's also they also um, highlight how um, research placements for student students can give opportunity to consider other career options like clinical research delivery or clinical academic roles. Um, and also it allows the development of research skills, um, but also leadership skills, communication skills, decision making, problem solving, critical analysis and delegation. They're all skills that clinical research delivery staff are using on a daily basis. So our um, placements that we developed at Nottingham were really clinical research delivery placements. And there were a number of agendas that we wanted to meet by developing these, these placements. So um, one main thing is as a, a clinical research delivery nurse, I really wanted to highlight clinical research nursing as a viable and exciting career option for students post qualification. And again, as Julia just highlighted, it's really difficult for students to aspire to being something post registration if they've never had an opportunity to actually observe or see that see what that career really develop really means and what skills that career utilizes. Um, it also gives um, an opportunity for research training and skills. I'm very committed to research in the broadest sense. Um, and there's a lot of research training for clinical academic careers that are available to people who are interested in that pathway. But actually the clinical research delivery placements also gave students the opportunity to develop some research training and research skills which were, are useful and utilised within clinical research delivery. Um, most of you who are in um, healthcare organisations will understand the um, drive to maximise um, capacity for student placements across clinical areas and in my divisional role I see that a lot of our ward areas are really maximise the number of students that they can have and can be supported adequately by the staff um, and so actually opening up some different some different clinical areas such as clinical research areas um, to a um, take students meant that it um, really expanded and maximised our capacity within our organisation for student practice placements across different clinical areas. Um, and also one of the things that we do know um, from taking students in clinical areas is that if students have a good experience within our clinical areas, they quite often come back post registration to continue to work there in those areas. And that's something that we hadn't really utilised within our research areas. But we want and whilst we don't necessarily have difficulty recruiting to research posts, actually recruiting um, post registration nurses who also have GCP training, who also have experience, Experience of research, however brief that might can, might be, can really aid recruitment and make sure that we are getting um, people into our research posts who understand what clinical research delivery jobs involve and are committed to that. Next slide, please, Lucy. So what we do in our clinical research delivery placements are their skills and experience based. So there are some skills that um, the students will develop. We um, encourage them to do GCP and consent training. And we really see that as this as being a transferable skill that they can take away with them to use in other areas of clinical practice. Consent training in particular is very transferable when we're looking at um, consent for care. Um, but GCP also gives, the, as we know, the broadest um, understanding of research and some of the ethical and governance issues. Um, the, the students can also develop clinical skills depending on where their research placements are. The research placements that I um, 
that I developed are in um, cancer and associated specialties, looking at cancer, haematology, renal and breast. But I know Navita is going to talk about her experience in the children's hospital. So there's a range of clinical skills that students can develop as part of their research placement. We also encourage them to develop some lab skills, sample processing skills and such like, which actually they, students would have um, difficulty developing in other clinical areas. So that's really a unique skill that they can develop as part of clinical research delivery. Um, we also encourage them to um, participate in data entry and query resolution, and that really um, gives them the opportunity to understand the depth and detail required in um, research data and to also um, develop some of those critical thinking skills, those problem solving skills, those some, and some of those analytical skills to translate what's happening in practice into the data that's required for clinical research. We encourage um, students to um, go on delegation of duties logs where the sponsor is supportive of that. And obviously there are some governance issues associated with that. But having students on the delegation log means that they can participate in some of those clinical, um, clinical procedures um, that are required for the research projects. Um, because our um, clinical research delivery areas are embedded within our clinical areas, it also gives them the opportunity to have um, a range of insight visits into some of the clinical areas. So they can spend some time on the wards in the renal department, they can spend time on the dialysis unit, they can go and visit see, uh, clinical nurse specialists, etc. So actually they're getting dual experience, so um, clinical research delivery experience, but also insight visits and experience into the clinical areas, which um, is really beneficial to them. We um, ask them to screen for potential participants, both um, electronically and um, in person. Um, and we also get, encourage them to be, um, in, be involved in site initiation and close down visits. And this really gives them the experience of end to end research, the setup and close down and delivery of research, which I think students find really useful because then they can see the, the beginning and end of research projects. Um, next slide, please, Lucy. So as I say, my, the research, um, to give an example of the project, the um, placements that we've developed in my area, um, the, pay, the students rotate round four different areas over four weeks. So they're getting a, um, a range of clinical um, skills and experience underpinned by um, the continuity of clinical research delivery skills. So they will rotate round renal, haematology, oncology and breast services. They'll have clinical insight visits. They're able to visit radiotherapy and see some of those treatment options for patients with cancer. We also encourage them to do some of the NIH our online bite-sized training. As those of us who are in clinical research delivery know, sometimes there are some downtimes, um, some admin, um, where the um, clinical research delivery staff are doing, doing things that, um, it, that the, the students can't participate in. But actually there's a range of um, available training that's online so that students can fill that time with doing other things like the NIHR bite-sized training and they also have the opportunity to visit our central our research and innovation department so they can see what those central research and innovation functions are and how they support the delivery of research. Next slide please Lucy. What I would say is that um, clinical research delivery um, placements aren't necessarily straightforward and one size doesn't fit all. We have had to consider which students we have in those placements and at what point in their training and for how long those placements are delivered for. So at the moment we have second year students um, for four weeks within our placements. Um, students and staff need encouragement to think creatively about how to meet the competencies and outcomes that are required of students. Um, and, and sometimes students do need um, some encouragement to see the clinical value of clinical research delivery. That's partly due to lack of experience and, and they're desperate to go on the wards and do what they consider to be proper nursing. But I think that it's our responsibility as clinical research delivery staff to show that um, clinical research nursing is proper nursing. We are using our nursing skills, maybe in different ways and in different contexts, but still very important. And that actually it is possible for them to meet their um, competency outcomes as part of it in their placements with us.
it does take cross team working to create a fulfilling and useful placement particularly because our students rotate around four different clinical areas but actually that's been really beneficial for our clinical research delivery staff giving us an opportunity to work across teams with each other to um, deliver a placement that's really exciting innovative and interesting for the students and we've also created some of our own resources which can be utilized during downtime for instance creating um, things like excel spreadsheets so that students can practice screening for patients for different trials um, if just so that we have additional um, resources and things that can be used depending on um, where our where in the process some of our research um, studies are because what we don't want is our students to be to find that they've got time on their hands that they don't know how to utilize so we have re um, developed some of our own resources which can which are all on a shared area which students can access as and when that's appropriate Next slide, please, Lucy. So I'm really excited to um, welcome Navita, who is going to discuss her um, experience of one of our student placements um, in the Children's Hospital. Navita, I'll hand over to you. Hi, so I'm Navita and I worked at Nottingham Children's Hospital with the clinical research team. Um, there I gained an array of skills that I wouldn't have had the chance to, as Julie and Sarah mentioned, and wards. So you, you don't really know about the opportunities that you get within clinical research until you really go into it. I'd never before considered it as a career option or even known that it was an option with um, nursing. So I think it was great to have that perspective as a student nurse. Um, so whilst I was on the placement, I did the GCP training, as previously mentioned, my informed consent training, and I helped prepare for loads of different trials. Um, I attended the trials as well. Um, I helped to set up study days and training sessions. Um, I recruited patients, um, and I also helped train other student nurses and staff for the studies. Um, so I'd go onto the wards and train them there. Uh, I worked with diabetes studies, um, neonatal intensive care studies, P PICU studies as well. And also something different was working with adults within the COVID trials. That's something that I hadn't really had the opportunity to do. And you normally get to do that with your elective placement, but um, for us, our elective was canceled due to COVID. So I didn't really have the opportunity to do that, but working within research, um, it was a unique opportunity, I think, because I got to help out with the COVID trials, which you wouldn't normally have had the chance to if you were on this research placement, but it gave me the opportunity to also work with adults, which was quite different and interesting. Um, I helped input, so you do get a fair amount of spare time, as was mentioned as well. And during that time, I helped um, input data for the COVID trials. So again, that was something that I didn't really get the opportunity to do whilst on ward placements but it helped me use DHR and I think all of these little things help when you become a registered nurse as you don't really get the opportunity to do that whilst you're studying. Um, yeah. So in terms of putting this into perspective, it helped me really understand how research goes into nursing. You don't really think about the, the backstory or how these drought these drugs and how these trials come into you know play but I think it really helped me see how all of that comes together um, it also worked with an array of healthcare professionals so research nurses the um, the specialist nurses the research assistants and the consultants that were running the trials um, and then I also helped I joined this little forum that um, so it was because I was working with children um, they had something to it was almost like a focus group for the children so that they could debrief about the trials and they would also do little things outside of the actual trials just to I think provide some um, something different for them which again was interesting um, and then there I think I, I worked with the HR side of things as well and I met this lady who told me about 
the lack of diversity and representation within research nursing and I think that was something that really intrigued me um, because it is true that there, there is a lack of BAME representation within patients recruited to the trials as well as the staff working so in terms of the nursing staff and I think it was quite yeah that really drew me and it has I've always had an interest in research because I studied biology before this but um, I think it really raised the importance of trying to break down that barrier of getting into research and um, yeah so that was really again quite interesting um, and now I am considering clinical research as a potential career path which I hadn't I wouldn't have if I hadn't gone on the placements so I think it really is important to give students this opportunity to have this as a placement and open these doors as you wouldn't really consider this otherwise. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Can I just jump in there and say, Navita, well done. There's lots of clapping and Naomi said that it's so, so brilliant to hear about such a dynamic placement and, you know, the impact that that it's had on you personally, but also on on patients and on the future of nursing. So, so fantastic, well done. <laughs> Lucy, are you okay to share the slides? Yep. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Navita. We're really proud of you. Thank you. Um, next slide, please, Lucy. OK, and can you skip to the next one for me? Thank you. So uh, following the tough act of following Navita, um, I'm now going to hopefully emphasise some aspects about um, encouraging undergraduate students to think about ways they can become confident users and producers of research. So the Council of Deans um, in 2019 produced this really useful document all about this and highlighting about um, <clears throat> they obviously conducted a survey amongst members and professional bodies and other stakeholders looking at how research was integrated into pre-registration curriculum. And I think what this does is provide a whole series of case studies which show a different approaches taken by universities to make students these confident users of research. And I think Brenda McCormick makes a really good point at the beginning of this, that there's a really obvious potential to increase research opportunities for students through close collaboration between universities and practice placement partners. And I think what I'm going to describe next is an example of what we did um, in Birmingham um, and actually our case study is featured in the Council of Deans report um, as an example of some work that was done. So it is just an example. There's a whole array of other approaches taken, but I am going to feature the, the way that we've done things in Birmingham. Um, next slide, please. So um, again, I'm just going to draw on some of the information from within the Council of Deans report because the survey did highlight some really useful um, information as a starting point for us here. Um, so we can see here that the most common ways that research was integrated into pre-reg curriculum was research informed teaching and teaching on evidence based practice and this module on research methods. But what the survey did find was that there was a big um, range in from 0 to 100 percent in students having the opportunity to be engaged in primary research and where they were. This is most commonly a literature review. And actually uh, what we've gone on to do is to perhaps find a slightly more uh, practical way, more experiential learning opportunity to uh, enable students to get a taste for research. Um, next slide, please. So the barriers, um, the survey again addressed some of the barriers, which I think many of us are aware of. And I think the three key ones I've highlighted with some stars there, which was about comp competing curriculum demands. I, I'm, you know, my uh, disclaimer is I, I work in the NHS, so I'm not designing the uh, HEI's um, curriculum. Um, and I can understand there's a lot of different demands. But I think what we've really seen from this is that we've really got to consider how we're going to generate those research, those um, registered nurses of the future. So it's got to feature in there. There's obviously um, some issues about lack of expertise in the team um, and then students themselves lacking the skills required to become involved in research. Now, I think um, when you look at this, actually, I think it's not so much that students lack the skills, they just need the, need the opportunities to be able to gain the skills. And that's the real shift for me. Um, next slide, please. 
So as you can see, there's um in the report they summarise approaches to undergraduate education. Um, and there's obviously uh, modules on research methods and evidence-based practice, um, undertaking the dissertation itself and internships. But actually there's, um, there are some published accounts that show that undergraduate students would prefer more experiential opportunities to gain direct experience of research as opposed to this more traditional lecture-based learning. Um, there are a few published case studies about research as an elective placement. So these are where students have obviously sought out their own op uh, placement and um, negotiated it on an individual basis. But the problem is how you scale that upwards. Um, and at the time in 2017, we were setting up a placement. There were very few opportunities for undergraduate students to gain any direct experience. Um, next slide, please, Lucy. So just looking back at the clinical academic career pathway, so the AUKUH have done this lovely um, diagram, which I think dates back to 2016. Um, and they obviously cite this very um, quote that we often use, which is about only 0.1% of the registered nurse midwifery workforce are working as clinical academics. And you can see, obviously, they've got this whole pathway mapped out of how we can generate that. But actually, what I want to highlight is, and it's on the next slide, please, Lucy, is that we've really there's this step before that how do we get in there at this early point in the undergraduate population what can we do to engage them as we've highlighted earlier if you can't um if you can't see it how can you want to be it and i think there's an element here about us talent spotting and then supporting those actually it's not just talent spotting because there are students who are obviously very high achievers but it's also those with a research interest and a passion um and also this flair that we that, that we want to support and develop and that goes right through from the heis right through to the practice placement areas so we work together to help sort of nurture this within that group so um next slide um you can see here our undergraduate research placements so um in 2017 you can see my cohort one here who's missing one person because she had to do hers at a slightly different time point uh, cohort two there were eight of them uh, and cohort in 2019, I ran three cohorts, which nearly killed me um, because each placement was four weeks in length. So I ran one in April, one in May to June and one in July to August. Um, in 2020, we obviously weren't able to run one. Um, there were obviously all students weren't allowed into that kind of placement area. But this year we've resumed them again and uh, we've just had seven students. Ooh, Sorry, Lucy, you could just about pass it. Uh, we've just had seven students um, this year with us. And I'd just like to acknowledge Carl, um, who is my co-lead for the elective and who I couldn't do it without. So I'm standing here representing two of us who run this placement. Um, I think the other thing to say is that we started off with one university, the University of Birmingham. We did actually expand it to Birmingham City University. So that's our cohort two. And we're currently in discussions with the University of Coventry about whether this is a placement they could do. I also have a student from the University of Worcester who I'm negotiating a special uh, placement for as well. So we're up to, I think, the evaluations which I'm going to present next include the uh, views of uh, 24 students. Uh, next slide, please, Lucy. So the aim of the placements is for undergraduate students to gain experience, knowledge and skills in the design and conduct of research. Um, you know, when we set out to do it, um, it seemed like big dreams and we were a bit like, oh, gosh, are we aiming too high? You know, we want them to gain practical skills associated with carrying out research. Now, my caveat here as well is that we use the term research because but it, actually the projects most commonly the students are involved with are classified as audit. Uh, quality improvement service evaluation. However, we use um, we do use the term research because it comes under a, uh, the research placement for one of the universities. But we're mindful that they're not all involved in true research studies. Um, and then there's hope that they would develop some personal skills from the placement. And actually, we've been really lucky. We've achieved more than we first thought we were going to, which has been uh, really good. Um, next slide, please. So uh, just to give you an overview of what we're talking about and what's involved in running this, um, I'm just bringing up my notes for myself here so I don't miss anything. So we're talking about a four week placement, um, 150 hours for students. We run this at the middle, to, well, at the end of their second year. A key thing for us has been um, that we opened it up to all fields of practice. Um, we felt that 
um, that would be learning relevant to all fields of practice, even though it was in, it was initially only in Birmingham Children's Hospital. In fact, we this year we've expanded it to Birmingham Women's Hospital because we're part of the same trust. But we've opened it up to adult and um, mental health fields of practice as well. At UOB, this was an elective, so i.e. We, we attend a launch and we pitch for it. Um, in previous years, um, this has been quite hard to convince people to come and stay in Birmingham when uh, quite often the elective is traditionally a, a thing that people go to some glamorous location overseas and have a very nice time uh, for four weeks. Um, so actually pitching research is quite tricky sometimes. However, we've always had a steady interest in it. Um, project selections. Projects are generated by the clinical areas. Um, we get uh, clinical areas to submit them as suggestions and then the program leads, myself and Carl, we review them in line with um, hospital or well, local and hospital wide priorities, but also the supervisor availability. It's really important that we can give the students a quality placement. So it may be it's a really hot topic. It's really something that needs to be addressed ASAP within the trust. But actually that supervisor is on annual leave because it's the summer holiday. So then that wouldn't be a project that we prioritise. In the very early stages, we tried to match the students to projects, uh, but actually this was incredibly difficult um, because also if you told them the theme of the area of research, then they could think it sounded really interesting. But actually the particular question that was being answered might not have been so interesting. And we also had issues about uh, some questions being more popular than others. So now we base it on the transferability of the topic. So e.g. if a student is an adult field of practice, we try to ensure it's in something transferable like medicines management, for example, or if their mental health field of practice, we focus on something that's perhaps not physiological data focused, but maybe something to do with medicines or um, to do with sort of psychological well-being or communication. The projects themselves vary hugely in size and scope from very early um, scoping of an aspect of practice, i.e. someone said, I think we've got a problem with X, right through to a much more structured internal audit process. Um, so as a result, the level of analysis can really vary hugely for the students, right from, um, I've got an example of one we did where the starting point was we can never find the keys on intensive care. Um, and um, we sat down with the student and we said, right, how do you think we're going to tackle this? Um, and we planned a service evaluation from scratch, which meant obviously we had only a limited amount of data at the end of it, but she worked her way through all that initial um, gripes and tricky parts about how do you collect data, what's it going to look like um, and how you're going to make sense of it. Um, and then the supervisor selection. So where possible, the lead supervisor is an RN um, in a clinical research or leadership role. However, where it's not possible, we've used um, allied health professionals um, with a with a program lead co-supervising. We really embrace inter interdisciplinary working and we use associate supervisors to help advise and support on aspects that would be regarded as part of nursing um, practice, for example. Um, we just put a minimum requirement of how many hours per week to review the project plan, assist with identification of any relevant literature, data and assist with interpretation. But actually we found our um, colleagues to be extremely supportive of it. We've had a medic, we've had two consultants, we've had a physio, we've had a pharmacist and they've all worked and they've all um, provided really positive feedback of working with nursing students. In terms of method, the projects are required to underpin um, their project using an appropriate framework. So they have to make reference, for example, to an appropriate QI cycle. Um, and the students are required to present at the end of the four week placement using an academic template. So very much in a traditional conference style presentation and to an invited audience of uh, lecturers, supervisors and senior managers. Basically, anyone really who's got a stake is a stakeholder in the work that's been conducted. Um, the projects are obviously registered on appropriate databases beforehand. I think the key thing to all of this is about the fact that students are actively involved. They're not just sitting in a research office reviewing, re reviewing notes, although that could be involved. The projects are selected on the basis of the students needing to be out and about in clinical areas, explaining who they are, what they're doing, and hopefully seeing practice in a new light. Next slide, please, Lucy. So this is an example of induction day that we do on day one. We do a pre-placement questionnaire, which is individual and confidential. Um, and then we run some group work on the first day. So you can see an example here of some of the questions that we've done. Um, there's a, uh, some notes here from one of our um, fir very first groups here about um, the three words they summarise how they felt at the start of the placement. We get some great 
feedback from this actually and I particularly always like this one because the curious part comes out um, which is really nice because that's exactly what we want them to be we want them to be curious about what the placement is going to involve and what they're going to find out um, next slide please so these are examples of all the projects that we've run from 2017 to 2019. I won't go into them all, but you can see they're obviously divided into more hospital wide ones. And then a large number of them are based on PICU, partly because that's where I'm based. And I have a team of research nurses who are fantastic at supporting these students. So they also get a chance to see what research nurses do. Um, so I kind of fly the flag for that part of it as well. They see a bit of their job, but also my research nurses are in a really good place to help and support them with um, doing their audits in clinical practice. These students haven't actually been into critical care settings yet at this particular point. We have adult field of practice students, so um, they're not used to seeing children and young people in, um, in, who are critically ill. So we're really mindful to support our students at, when they do these projects. Um, next slide, please. So here you can see some of our students out and about. In the top picture, we've got Rosie, who's there talking to a bedside nurse um, about intravascular um, devices. She did an audit looking at um, the placement of them, how many there were, what infusions were running through them, and the rationalisation process, what decisions were being made about what infusion to run on what lumen. And that led to some uh, trust-wide work actually looking at the um, uh, the use of uh, central lines and actually how how central lumens line lumens were prioritised. In the second picture, you can see Harriet, and she's looking at pain and sedation scores. It's a topic we've looked at a number of times on the unit, and this is before a very big study that we've just done um, in in PICU field. Um, but Harriet's there actually reviewing our current practice. Um, with one of the bedside nurses. In the third picture, um, you can see Ellie and Sophie, who worked as pair here, um, and they're actually reviewing what a registered nurse on PICU does. So they were capturing data in real time about workload. Um, and you can, as you can see, they're independent, they're together. Um, and actually what they were doing was they were setting together. And then once they were confident in their, um, that they were analysing in the same way and their integrated reliability was good, they then went off and worked independently. So they actually worked with each other there, so they had peer support. And in the final picture, you can see Chidza, who is from my co recent cohort. Um, obviously, we're working slightly differently at the current moment. She is there evaluating education interventions that we've conducted as part of um, uh, an early mobilisation programme on PICU. So she's actually on a Zoom call with the study team feeding back about how her work is going. So that's them out and about in real life doing things. Um, next slide, please. So in terms of how we evaluated the programme, um, we looked at it both from the individual, the organisational aspects, um, and we looked at evaluation, pre-placement, end of placement and one year. One thing that uh, was, uh, was a slight oversight was I wish I'd registered it as a proper um, uh, I registered it as a service evaluation of the placement itself in year one, um, which meant that I have got responses from students evaluating the placement, but I couldn't track their them as individuals, um, and um, which with hindsight I kicked myself for because it meant I couldn't track an individual's progression uh, through the whole time point. However, they were on the whole overall supportive of the whole programme. Um, and then I'll show some figures about the organisational benefit as well. Next slide, please. So here you can see the breakdown of all of our cohorts. This is taken from our public paper, which was published earlier this year. So it features the 24 students who did the placement up until 2019. As you can see, a nice spread of them, actually only just only 12 of them, so only half of them are actually child field of practice. Um, we had almost as many adult field of practice. And there's one mental health out, although I've recently had another mental health student on our recent cohort. And you can see that um, we start off with the evaluations. It, evaluations at one year, dropped to 17 out of 24 at the final year. However, this was because the survey last year was being conducted during the COVID uh, period, which I think may have affected the response rate because I think people had a lot on their plate to think about at that time. Uh, thanks, Lucy. So you can see these are the kind of activities that students are doing. Um, this is completed by them. So this is what they recognise they've done. So data collection, data entry, data analysis, obviously the most common aspects, but we've had them doing, you know, developing a data collection tool um, and right down to designing a questionnaire um, and interviewing one student actually involved with um, 
uh, appreciative inquiries. Uh, she was working on a project related to learning from excellence, engaged in appreciative inquiry. Uh, uh, so she got some ex some exposure to interviewing staff and understanding how to conduct an interview, which is a uh, great exposure for her. Um, next slide, please. So this is the kind of feedback we get, and I'm mindful of time because I think Anna, listening to Annabelle is probably even better than listening to my slides summarising it. But you can see here that we broke it down into personal impact and professional impact. And um, I put the percentages up there that, that the students uh, rated. So this is student uh, opinions on what skills they'd gained. But I think what's really important for me is the, the qualitative quotes that went with it. Um, and there were so many lovely ones about how it helped to build their confidence and experience in managing their own workload um, and about having the independence to make the project what I wanted at my own schedule. And that was tricky. I haven't put up here the supervisor feedback, but actually supervisors there was some feedback at one point that it was tricky sometimes to let a student go at their own pace and to um, when you could just, you know, sometimes you're like, oh, I just wish it would go a bit faster. But actually, the whole emphasis is on the student. It's student directed. And so um, we let them, it's almost like that thing where they have an opportunity to learn it at their own pace. And we give them that time and space to do that. And Sarah was saying that um, she wants to get it up and running and pilot it in CAS. So I was saying, oh. yeah, brilliant. Let's pilot it in CAS. Oh, Lucy, are you able to? Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, so looking at the professional outcomes, um, again, uh, the key things for, for us were that they gained research knowledge um, and they got insight into clinical, into a clinical management and clinical care. And actually those, oh, oh sorry, Lucy, you just get back. Yeah, that's brilliant. Um, and those were the aspects that were rated 100%, which was great. Um, it was really nice to see that they used it as an opportunity to look at clinical practice. And um, you can see the quote here that talks about observed nurses would often engage in education and taught me through their practice decision making and paperwork. So it was brilliant. I think what they really realised was that research wasn't separate to what they were doing as well. They really got the opportunity to learn about clinical based care and the research skills and also how the two informed each other. I also I put up the other. Oh, sorry, Lucy. I put up this quote at the top because this person said, I don't think research it has been an important experience, but I don't think research is for me. But I'm glad I've tried it and I've learned a lot. And I think that's really important to acknowledge it. Research isn't for everybody. We absolutely get that placements, uh, you know, working as a clinical research nurse or as an academic. It's not for everybody. But you know what? She'd done it. She recognised it was important. And actually, the way I see it is that she will be a nurse who is at least got knowledge and skills in what's involved in doing this kind of work and hopefully she'll take that forward in her clinical practice. So I think it's important to acknowledge that it isn't for everyone but she still evaluated the placement as a learning experience really well. Um, next slide please. So evaluations at one year and actually I found these quite interesting in some ways because uh, yeah, they had a whole year to kind of reflect on the placement and you think oh four weeks is it really going to have made any sustained impact on them or is this just something that you know they did in the summer it wasn't really um, part of their assessment process but actually the feedback was really positive both in terms of personal and professional skills um, and I mean the figures are all there but I really what I really like was just the fact that they they um, there was the bit about enthusiasm for clinical improvement 100% and that for me was really the crucial outcome from this is that you know they may not all want to go on and do a master's or a PhD but actually they could see there was a need to do clinical improvement and they had now got some knowledge and skills in how to do that uh, so those were the really important outcomes for me from that um, next slide please so again, if you map that then to what that means in terms of academic outputs, you can see 88% said they were willing to consider audit or quality improvement in their first job. 59% said that they were willing to consider or they were in, likely or very likely to consider a research nurse role. So Sarah, recruitment for us looks like it should increase, which is good. 65% would consider doing um, an MSc or even a PhD. 82% um, were interested in a future role which had an active research component, such as a clinical clinical nurse specialist or AMP and quite reassuring for me because I guess there aren't always that many people that they see in a nurse researcher role 55% of them thought said that they would consider a post like mine which was good because I was worried I might put them off um, but I think you can see that this really maps into this pathway of us working and getting our students engaged and becoming real clinical academics um, next slide please 
So I'm conscious of time, so I'm just going to skirt over this, but we evaluated the organisational impact and you can see some of the aspects here are local, which was appropriate to the project. Some of them weren't going to have huge scope, but actually they all led to something. They all, all of the results were fed back. So there was new updated audit plans right through to informing future research and funding, um, which is obviously really important. It's a really important building block in a pathway to getting funding to sometimes have gathered some of this baseline data. And I think key thing there for me is about you can see um, the local service development and practice change. It was fed back to the right people in those departments and it led to changes as a result, which is great. Um, next slide. Um, and you can see here in terms of dissemination, they obviously did their presentation to us at the end of placement, but actually 12 of them went on to, uh, to present a departmental presentation, two at an organisation wide presentation, three at a national presentation and four at an international conference. And you can see here a number of slides, including Annabelle, who's going to talk next in the very top slide, presenting uh, in Salzburg um, as still as a student. And then in terms of academic output, three of the students have been able to use the work as dissertations. That's hopefully increasing even further this year. We've got a number of papers st um, still in development and, and draft. COVID has scuppered a few of those in terms of timelines, but also, as I say, led to future funding. And then in terms of award um, awards, on the next slide, you can just see that the, pro the placement itself Oh, sorry, Lucy, could you skip? Thank you. Uh, we were finalists in terms of it being a teaching innovation. We won an Improvement Project of the Year award, which was nice. We featured in the Council of Deans case study. But as I say, perhaps most importantly, it's led to research grants. So, for example, the SWELL uh, project, which is mentioned here, which is looking at psychological um, interventions for PICU staff. Actually, one of the building blocks in that grant was a survey looking at national resources and national um, work that was national resources at each of the units in across the country which was actually the starting point for one of the students projects so it it led right through to them eventually getting a, a large grant um next slide please oh on to annabelle so yes i think annabelle is well will speak much even better about this actually so thank you and i hand over to you annabelle um so i am um, annabelle i did a placement with julie um, with the research team at the end of my second year in 2018. Um, I'm qualified now and currently work on intensive care at children's, but as I'll talk through, still have interest and things I do involve with research now. Um, so before I started the placement, I um, wasn't really sure what to expect. Um, as we talked about earlier, the research exposure you get in lectures, I feel like isn't quite the same as the practical stuff you experience. So I wasn't really sure what I was going to be doing day to day. Um, and it had only been running a couple of years before that. Um, but I was quite open to see what it was like and looking forward to doing something different because it is very different to what you do on your ward based placements. Um, so on my first day, I didn't really know what was expected of me and um, it, it sounded when I first got the project it was very new and it was quite open for me doing what I felt was suitable to do with it so I had to set up an audit tool work out what I was going to do and what I was going to look at and do a lot of independent work that I hadn't really done previously as a student because ward placements are a lot more structured um, so I was worried about having all that responsibility and organisation and managing it well. But um, yeah, I felt it went OK. And I'll talk about my experiences throughout the placement. If you can go to the next slide, please. So, yeah, while I was on placement, I developed my own data collection tool. Um, I was reviewing ward round discussions on intensive care about sedation. And ventilation so developed a tool that was looking at those things and the questions we wanted answering trialed that and um, reviewed it with Julie and other professionals about if it was suitable and then organized some data collection and put it in table did some analysis um, and reviewed this with physios because it was quite a physio led project and then at the end of the placement presented that work to 
uh, a whole range of professionals, physios, doctors, uh, band-aids from the intensive care team and the girls from the research team as well, um, which was quite a lot of people to present to at the end of the placement. It was quite scary as for the end of my second year, but it was a good experience and I did enjoy it. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So, yeah, at the start of the placement, I uh, had a introduction day, decided a plan for completing the project, had some check-ins part way through, did some drafts and reviewed them with Julie and other members of the research team. And um, that helped improve my organisation skills and time management, as I previously said. And data collection and analysis, which was something I'd never really done before. Um, and you go through the theory of it when you're in lectures and things like that, but doing it practically is different and gives you, um, oh, sorry, gives you a lot more transferable skills from it. Um, it gave me a lot of confidence working in new areas as well, because I am from adult field of practice. So when I went on my placement, I hadn't been in intensive care environment before and I hadn't been in a children's hospital before um, and to go in and attend ward rounds with consultants and doctors and AMPs and stuff like that was uh, quite intimidating at first but everyone was really lovely and it did improve my confidence a lot to be able to meet new people and work in new areas. Um, I really enjoyed the experience in PIC and the research team. Um, it did change my career plan um, and I think if I hadn't done the placement, I wouldn't be working in paediatric intensive care as I am now and still having an interest in research. And the presentation definitely helped my public speaking skills. Um, and everyone was really good with feedback and was really interested in the stuff they had to say. And I feel that I did feel like I had done something that would help the trust and the team that I had done. It was good to feel like I was contributing to a larger project, um, which I have done over consecutive years as well. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So yeah, after the elective, I changed my plan for my newly qualified job. So I ended up doing my management placement on intensive care at the Children's Hospital and got my newly qualified job there. I'll have been there two years in November. Um, still interested in research and have done things with Julie throughout that and uh, looking at the comments with the research team and things like that. Um, I wrote up the work I did for my dissertation and then I've um, had the opportunity to repeat the work in 2019 and then I've also supervised a student to repeat the work this year in 2021. Um, which was also a great opportunity to be able to supervise a student in the research team um, after being there two years. So I'm um, working on publishing three years worth of data from that and writing that up. Um, did some national conferences in Birmingham and then I was very lucky for the university and the hospital to fund me to go to, um, I can't remember what it was called, but it was in Salzburg and it was a European PICS conference. Um, and that was a great opportunity and something I never thought I would have got to do from it. But it was really good, learned lots, um, met a whole range of new people and things like that. Um, and I do have an increased interest in day to day working. So when I'm clinical and bedside nursing, um, I do, I'm interested in the studies and stuff that are going on and like to hear what's going on and get involved with it and champion it when I am there on intensive care, which is another day-to-day -day part, which is good from it. And just promoting it to other people. Um, I've been to the university with Julie to um, promote the elective, um, things like that. and. Yeah, that's been good. Next slide, please. Um, so I think, yeah, this is just basically the timeline of what my experience has been, which I've talked through really. So 2018, I did my first elective and wrote my dissertation up in 
2018-2019 about early mobilisation I was ethnic to the conference and that was in June 2019 um, so just at the end of my final year and I started in October 2019 on PICU and then we did a repeat audit in September 2019 and August 2021 one with myself one with a student and I'm working to write that up now so yeah that's my experience Thank you, Annabelle. That's brilliant. Um, so um, we're just coming to the end of the webinar now. Um, and really, Julie and I just wanted to um, say that these are just a couple of examples of things that we've put in place in our own organisations. But I'm sure that there are other people on the webinar who can think of other ways to engage um, student nurses. And at Nottingham, we have um, this phrase, which is engage and these empower to articulate how in our trust we want to drive nursing research for forward. So we want to engage frontline staff with research in all of its forms. We want to enthuse them about the impact that it can have on clinical practice and also the enjoyment of carrying out research activities and finally we want to empower them to pursue a career which includes research somewhere within it and that might be as a clinical research delivery um, member of staff it might be as a clinical academic it might just be as a frontline nurse who engages with research activities as that impacts on their frontline clinical practice but if we only start once their employees at our trust or at your organisations, then have you missed a crucial step in this pursuit of nursing excellence in research? Lucy, next slide, please. So we're just thinking that perhaps there's a, 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 a uh, an earlier step where we expose people um, and by engaging nurses with the research agenda at the pre-registration pre stage we're able to expose them to both the practices and the potential of research I and mean, then this provides the foundation for them to engage with research earlier on in their post-registration career because they're already enthused with by the possibilities which a research active nursing career provides and they're ready to embrace those opportunities for empowerment to pursue research when they present themselves and we really see that this is a fundamental element of building capacity and capability for nursing research both now and into the future and that's what we're trying to do with our 70 at 70 nurse and midwife research leader roles thanks so much for listening to um, us talking about our experiences and we're two minutes to four o'clock but um, I'm sure that we've got some time for some questions if people um, have got those questions